1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26, through chapter 15, verse 11. Verse 26. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you has a psalm, has a doctrine, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation? Let all things be done unto edifying. Burkett notes, from this verse to the end of the chapter, the Apostle lays down particular precepts for the preservation of decency and good order in the Church of God. And first he advises, when they come together into the public assemblies, that if any of them had a psalm or a hymn suggested to them by the Spirit of God, to his glory, and the Church's edification, or had a doctrine either for instruction or consolation, or had a strange tongue, or the gift of interpreting tongues, let it be how it will, he exhorts, that all be done, so as may most and best tend to the benefit and edification of the church, which is the true end of church assemblies. The great end, design, and aim, which those who administer in holy things ought to propound to themselves in all their public administrations, is the church's edification, the people's growth and improvement in knowledge, faith, and holiness. Let all things be done to edifying. That is, let all your public offices be so performed and in such a manner as may best conduce to the end for which they were designed. Verses 27 through 33. And if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Let the prophets speak two or three, and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For you may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophet are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Burkett notes, our Apostle's next advice for the Church's edification is this, that such as had the gift of tongues should not speak altogether, but two or three successively, one after another, and that one interpret what was so spoken to the benefit and edifying of the Church. But if there were no interpreter present, let him, says the Apostle, that only speaks with tongues, keep silence in the Church, and let him only speak mentally to himself and to God in prayer and thanksgiving. The same advice he gives to them that prophesied, to wit, that only two or three of them should prophesy successively, in order to the church's edification, and that the rest of the prophets should sit still and judge, examining their doctrines by the rule of the word. For, says he, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. That is, the doctrines which the prophets deliver are apt to be judged and examined by other prophets, whether they be agreeable to the word of God or not or the instinct by which the prophets pretend to be moved at the time to prophecy is subject to the judgment and censure of other prophets who are endowed with the same gifts. And thus he declares that all that are prophets and prophetically inspired may prophecy, provided it be done orderly and successively, without occasioning disorder and confusion in the church, and so managed as to answer the great end of the institution, namely the instruction, edification, and consolation of the church. For God is not the order of confusion, but of peace. Confusion is so far from being of divine inspiration that it's hateful to God, who requires that peace and order should be kept and maintained not only in the church of Corinth, but in all the churches of the saints. That which breaks order does also break peace, for there can be no true peace without order. And God is not the author of disorder and confusion in the churches, but of peace. Here, by the way, let us observe and note that speaking and preaching in the public assemblies is limited all along by the apostle to the prophets. Let the prophets speak, not the common people. They were to sit by. It was in no part of their business to speak, but to examine what was spoken by the rule of the word. The authoritative preaching of gifted brethren at the call of a private congregation, was no more permitted by St. Paul than a suffering of women to speak in the church. None but prophets or persons in office appointed for the work of preaching were ever suffered to undertake it in the primitive times, and downward, 
till very lately. Let such as first gave and still give encouragement to the contrary, consider how they will answer at the bar of God, who is not the author of such confusion and disorder, but of peace. Verses 34 and 35. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it's a shame for women to speak in the church. Burkett notes, A farther rule is here given by the Apostle for maintaining decency and order in public assemblies, namely, that the women should never presume to speak or utter anything as public teachers in the congregation, no, nor so much as ask any question publicly. Almighty God, having by his law made subjection, not public instruction, their duty, of which silence is a token. Here observe that it's not the woman speaking in the public assemblies when they join with the congregation in singing of psalms and prayers, but they're speaking by way of teaching and prophesying that is there forbidden. Note farther that the means of instruction were not denied the women. At home they might put forth questions to their husbands for their own information and satisfaction, but to do anything like this publicly was a shame or indecent thing, both to the church, the husband, and herself. Still observe how the God of order calls for order and delights in decency, especially in places where his religious worship is celebrated. He hath unworthy thoughts of God to think him either a patron of or pleased with any disorder, either in civil affairs or religious services. Verses 36-38 through 38. What, came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? If any man thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Burkett notes, These words are looked upon by interpreters as a smart reflection upon some of the ministers and members of the church at Corinth, who from a high opinion which they had of themselves and their own management, would not submit to the foregoing precepts, canons, and rules for the order and decency in the church of God. What, says the apostle, do you think that you have all the word and will of God? Doth all knowledge of scripture and resolution of doubts rest in your breasts and flow out of your lips? Consider you are not the first church that was planted. Jerusalem was before you. The gospel was sent to you. It did not come out first from you. Let's learn that all kind of scorn is not always uncomely. Men are apt to overrate themselves and to overvalue their own abilities, as if they had engrossed all knowledge that all must be borrowed from their store and light their candle at their torch. Now, in that case, we may, without breach of charity or blemish of holiness, check pride with derision and speak them below men who set themselves up above men. Observe next, the apostle affirms that these rules for order and decency which he had given them were from the Lord and he expected and required that those who esteem themselves prophets should observe and obey them as such. But if men will be ignorant and obstinate in their ignorance, be it at their peril, and let them look to it. Do not you regard them. If any be ignorant, let them be ignorant. Verses 39 and 40. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophecy, and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. Burkett notes, For a close of the whole, he exhorts them earnestly to endeavor after the gift of prophesying and not to forbid the use of the gifts of tongues, provided the forementioned rules and directions before given be observed, that so in their public assemblies all things relating to religious worship be performed with that becoming gravity and decency which may most and best conduce to the glory of God and the church's edification. Learn hence, one, that the whole of the church in general, and every individual member of it in particular, ought to perform all the duties of God's worship in a decent and orderly manner. Learn, too, that it's the duty of the church's governor to take care that order and decency be enjoined and observed in the church of God to the edification of all the members of it. Learn, three, that they only have authority to make churches orders whom the Lord has made churches governors. Learn, four, 
that such orders as relate to real decency and the worship of God, made and confirmed by the governors of the church, ought to be obeyed and conformed to by the members of the church, for conscience's sake, that all things may be done decently and in order. Chapter 15. Burkett Notes. The design and scope of our apostle in this excellent chapter now before us is to establish the doctrine of resurrection of the body, which some of the Church of Corinth at that time denied. The grand article of the Christian faith is here by several arguments defended, the absurdity of the contrary declared, the objections made against it fully answered, and Christian steadfastness in the faith and laborious diligence in the work of Christ urged and enforced to the end of the chapter. Verses 1 and 2. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Burkett notes, observe here, 1. The subject matter of St. Paul's preaching to the Corinthians. It was the gospel. I declared unto you the gospel which I preached, and particularly the doctrine of the body's resurrection, which was a great point of that gospel which he had preached and delivered to them. Observe, too, the obedience which many, if not most, of the Corinthians had given to the doctrine of the gospel. They heard it, believed it, and embraced it as the truth of God. Which gospel you received and wherein ye stand. That is, the best and greatest part of you are firm to your former profession, though some of you are fallen away. Observe three, the blessed effect which the gospel had upon those that did believe and receive it. By it, they were saved. That is, put into a savable state, brought into the right and only way that leads to salvation. The gospel reveals the object, salvation. It directs lost men which way to arrive at it, assures him that it's attainable, and inclines and encourages him seriously to endeavor after the attainment of it. Observe 4. The condition annexed and required on our part in order to the attaining that salvation which the gospel discovers unto us, and that is perseverance. For that is what is implied by our keeping in memory what we have received. Ye are saved if you keep in memory. If we do not steadfastly cleave to the gospel and to this grand doctrine of it, the resurrection, our hearing is in vain, our believing in vain, our hopes of salvation are vain. By the gospel we are saved if we keep it in memory and practice it. Otherwise, we have believed in vain. Verses 3-7 through seven. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scripture, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the scripture, and that he was seen of Cephas, and then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. Burkett notes, observe here the apostles' fidelity, one, in delivering nothing to the church but what he had received. I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, either immediately by Ananias or by immediate revelation from Christ himself. Observe, too, the principal and fundamental doctrines or articles of faith which the apostle in his preaching had insisted upon amongst them, namely the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that he died for our sins, that is, a voluntary sacrifice for our sins, to make an atonement for sin, as the prophets Isaiah and Daniel had long foretold, and that he was buried. The dead body of our dear Redeemer was decently buried by a small number of his own disciples, and continued in the state of the dead and under the power of death for a time. That he was buried is a demonstration of the certainty that he died, and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. Christ, though laid, was not lost in the grave but by the omnipotent power of his Godhead revived and rose again from the dead the third day to the consternation of his enemies and the consolation of all believers. Observe 3. How the Apostle proves the truth and verity of Christ's resurrection by ocular demonstration. He is risen, 
because he was seen alive after his passion, first of Peter, next of the whole college of the apostles, which formerly consisted of twelve, then of five hundred brethren at once in Galilee, whereof some of them were alive to testify it, after which he was seen of James, and then of all the apostles. These were all holy persons, who durst not deceive, and who confirmed their testimony with their blood, so that no article of faith, no point of religion, is of more confessed truth and infallible certainty than this of our Lord's resurrection. And blessed be to God that it is so, seeing the whole weight of faith, hope, and salvation depends upon Christ as risen from the dead. Behold how great a weight the scripture hangs upon this nail. Thanks be to God, it's a nail fastened in a sure place. Our Lord's resurrection is his church's consolation. Verse 8. And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. Burkett notes, As Christ was seen of St. Paul last of all the apostles, so it's probable he was seen last by him of all persons. We read, Not of any that saw Christ after St. Stephen and St. Paul, who here reckons himself among those who were eyewitnesses of the risen Jesus. Last of all, he was seen of me also. Observe farther, that great humility of St. Paul in styling himself an untimely birth, a person born out of due time. But in what sense does he mean that he was born out of due time? Answer, one, negatively. Not that he was, as to a spiritual birth, born too soon, but rather too late. Alas, he had been too long a proud Pharisee, a formal professor, a fiery persecutor. In this sense, he was no abortive or born out of due time, or rather born too late than too soon. But positively, he calls himself an abortive or untimely birth. One, because he was the last of the apostles that was called. The rest were called by Christ while here on earth. Paul was called by Christ from heaven, after his departure from earth to heaven. Two, because of the suddenness and violence of his conversion. An abortion is occasioned by some sudden surprise, some strain or violent motion. St. Paul's conversion was a wonderful, violent conversion out of the ordinary way and course. He was smitten from his horse to the ground and lay as one dead in his passage to his new life. Three, because abortive children are lesser, weaker, and more imperfect children than those of full growth. As an abortive child is the least of children, so he reckons himself the least of apostles, and styles himself so in the next verse, where he thus speaks. I was as one born out of due time. Verses 9 through 11. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not met to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach and so ye believed. Burkett notes, observe here, one, the profound humility of this great apostle, and how low he was in his own thoughts. He calls himself the least of the apostles, nay, not matter worthy to be called an apostle, because he had persecuted the church of Christ with so much fury and fierceness. Elsewhere, he styles himself less than the least of all saints, not that there can be anything less than the least, But the original being a double diminutive, his meaning is that he was as little as could be. O admirable humility, the more we know of God and ourselves, the more humble apprehensions we shall have of ourselves. A good man's thoughts are always lowest of himself. The more holiness any man has, the more humility he has. Humility is the great evidence of our holiness, it being indeed a great part of our holiness. Observe, too, how the Apostle ascribes all that he was, wherein he differed from others, to the grace of God. By the grace of God I am what I am. As we receive our natural being from the power of God, so we derive our spiritual being from the grace of God. If I forbear what is evil, it's from restraining grace. If I follow what's spiritually good, it's from sanctifying grace. Therefore, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to thy grace be the praise. Observe three, the blessed fruit which the grace of God produced in St. Paul. It caused him to labor. Grace is an active principle. 
to labor abundantly, to labor more abundantly than all the apostles. Not more than all of them put together, but more than any one of them that were as fellow apostles, separately considered. Such as receive most grace and favor from God are holily ambitious to do the utmost service for God. Observe for, lest he should seem to be too assuming and too arrogant, and to aggregate anything to himself, he adds, Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Behold how the holy apostle ascribes the fruit of all his endeavors to the grace of God, to the influences and assistances of the Holy Spirit of grace, exciting him, assisting him, working in and with him, and succeeding of him in all his enterprises and undertakings for the glory of God and the good of souls. I labored, yet not I, but divine grace that went along with me. Observe 5. The inference which the apostle draws from the whole. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. That is, whether it were I or any of the other apostles who labored most in the preaching of the gospel, the doctrine is the same. Namely, Christ died for our sins, rose again, and will raise us. This is the doctrine which we apostles preached, and which you Corinthians believed and received. Therefore, why should any of you now stagger in the faith and disbelieve the resurrection of the body, which is a blow made at the root of Christianity? Alas, what have we to carry our spirits through all the rugged passages and cross dispensations of this life, but only our hopes in reversion, only our hopes of a glorious resurrection and a blessed immortality?